Good morning. Uh, welcome everyone to Semmel Grand Rounds. Uh, it's my pleasure to open the Grand Rounds and introduce today's speaker, Roy Richard Grinker. He's a professor of anthropology and international affairs at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. He joins us from today. He's also editor in chief of the Anthropological Quarterly. Grinker was born and raised in Chicago, where his great grandfather, great grandfather, grandfather, and father worked as psychoanalysts. So he's the product of a long line of psychiatrists. He graduated from Grinnell College in 1983, received his PhD in social anthropology at Harvard in 1989, and he's been professor at George Washington University since 1992. Over his career, his work has really spanned an impressive range of domains, which is well illustrated by the titles of the books he's authored. These titles include Unstrange Minds, Remapping the World of Autism, In the Arms of Africa, The Life of Colin M. Turnbull, Korea and its Futures, Unification and the Unfinished War, Houses in the Rainforest, Ethnicity and Inequality Among Farmers and Foragers in Central Africa. He's also co-editor of Perspectives on Africa, Culture, History and Representation, as well as companion to the Anthropology of Africa. He's a true public intellectual as he's also published in the popular press, including a recent op-ed in the LA Times on grief and mourning during COVID. He's also uh, published um, in the New York Times in the past. And he also helped carry out the first epidemiological study of autism spectrum disorder in South Korea. He was a 2008 recipient of the National Alliance on Mental Illness Ken Award for Outstanding Contribution to the Understanding of Mental Illness and the 2010 recipient of the American Anthropological Association's Anthropology in the Media Award for Communication of Anthropology to the General Public through the Media. And really in keeping with the spirit of those two awards, his most recent book entitled Nobody's Normal, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness has been enthusiastically received by a broad audience. It was a New York Times Editor's Choice Book Award and will soon be published in Russian, Korean, Chinese, Japanese, Turkish, Portuguese, and Polish. Um, and Professor Grinker will share some of the insights and stories from his book in today's talk. Please join me in welcoming Professor Roy Richard Grinker to Semmel Grand Rounds today. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Ippi, and I'm really happy to be back at Semmel. I say back, I've never done Grand Rounds for you before, but uh, I did an evening event, oh, must have been about a decade or ago. Um, at that time, I was talking mostly about autism. Um, for my book, Nobody's Normal, which is really what I'm going to talk about today, um, I didn't focus on a particular condition. Um, I actually turned first to my family. As it be said, you know, my great grandfather was a psychiatrist. My grandfather was a psychiatrist. So was my father. Uh, so is my wife. And I have a daughter, Isabel, who's 30, diagnosed with autism when she was a little more than two and was non-speaking. And that, of course, influenced my interest in mental health. I was fortunate to grow up across the street from my grandfather. Uh, that's a rare occurrence these days where somebody can live so close to their relatives. And he used to talk often about Sigmund Freud and his analysis with Freud in Vienna. And he always emphasized that Freud's great achievement was not his metapsychology and it wasn't his uh, any particular book or article. It was the fact that Freud had used psychoanalysis as one method to extend psychiatry out of the asylum, to make psychiatry relevant to a much larger group of people, a much more diverse group of people than could be captured in the asylums under the categories of feeble-mindedness or insanity. Uh, as you all know, by mid 20th century, psychoanalysis was actually chic, so chic that um, psychiatry was one of the top uh, residency choices for people graduating from the most elite medical schools. Um, so anyway, thank you. Um, uh, I'm not going to use a PowerPoint uh, presentation, uh, and uh, I'm just going to talk to you. Um, I, I have very fond recollections of my first lecture uh, at uh, the Semmel Institute. I've spoken to UCLA Anthropology before, but um, uh, I remember that uh, event. It was an evening event and um, a very elderly and very elegant woman approached the stage uh, after my talk along with her nurse. 
And she said to me, is it possible that you're the grandson of the psychoanalyst Roy Grinker, who was working in Chicago during the late 1940s? And I said, yeah, that's my grandfather. And she said, I was his patient. And she then lifted up the leather bag in her, her right hand and, and said, he told me my purse was a vagina. And I always remember that story uh, because it was psychoanalytic, but also um, obviously uh, quite funny. Uh, despite living in very different times, all of my family members taught me the same thing, that mental illnesses are a double illness. First, the ailment itself, and second, society's negative judgment. My new book, Nobody's Normal, is about how we're starting to eliminate the shame and secrecy that has for so long shadowed mental illnesses. Indeed, one of the most remarkable stories of the last two decades has been the transformation of so many illnesses and disabilities away from being shameful and frightening into ones that are increasingly understood as part of what it means to be human. If we think about autism, you know, it was once a narrowly defined condition. It was devastating as a diagnosis, but it now encompasses enormous range of variation that includes great suffering, of course, but also strengths and skills. We've changed autism from something enigmatic into something that we understand. And with the help of the concept of Asperger's, which really served us well and we really needed it until recently, we don't need it anymore, uh, autism became a much less stigmatized phenomenon. And by stigma, I mean the, the, the object of secrecy and shame and isolation and self-hatred. I, I saw this transformation from disability and stigma to acceptance and understanding once in a span of just a few minutes a few years ago. Uh, it was a single event that still gives me goosebumps when I recall it. Um, it was at the Daughters of the American Revolution Constitution Hall. Um, and my daughter Isabel was giving a graduation speech. She was the first person with a disability who'd been asked to do that. Very, very large high school and a large audience of 3,000 people there. And she started to speak in her odd vocabulary and cadence and rhythm. And most people there didn't know who she was. She had been mostly in very small, closed classes. And um, there was a lot of murmuring and whispering and even laughing in the crowd uh, among the kids. Murmurs and whispers, these are the sounds of stigma. And then she got to a point in her speech where she said, people with autism like me, and the room just quieted down because what had been strange and unfamiliar, bizarre, now made sense because these kids and their families understood now what autism was, and they were being told about autism by somebody who took ownership of it and who advocated for herself. And I see so many examples of this in my own work at George Washington University. There's the student with Tourette's who stands up in the front of a 300 person lecture class at the very beginning of the semester and says, I wanna tell everybody I have Tourette's syndrome. I might say things that either shock you or seem startling or make sounds, just wanted you to know. Uh, the student who told me that getting diagnosed with ADHD was the best day of her freshman year because for the first time, somebody saw her as needing accommodations rather than being told she was lazy or stupid, wasn't working hard enough. So secretiveness, shame, isolation, self-hatred, as I said, these things that are encapsulated by the concept of stigma do seem, if only anecdotally, to be declining, especially for young people. And the question that I ask in the book is that if there are indeed important advances in reducing stigma, and increasing access to care, then can we identify the variables that have changed stigma? And if we can identify them, how do we stay the course? And I ask this question because we know a lot more about the micropolitics or the micro sociology of stigma rather than the underlying historical cultural forces that shape stigma over time. The many compassionate researchers who've done uh, work on, on devoted their whole careers to stigma, much 
more, many more years than I have, they've focused on more on the present, how labels and stereotypes alienate sufferers, how people with mental illnesses lose status and are discriminated against, how by necessity individuals manage their differences by trying to assimilate or trying to isolate themselves. However, we know less about why particular kinds of stigma emerge or what forms of power sustain them. And the answers to these questions are, are unlikely to be found in the basic sciences. You know, we cannot, and maybe we never will, see mental illnesses in a microscope or test for them in a laboratory. Their experiences shaped by more factors than we can imagine. I mean, genes, childhood, wealth, poverty, friendship, uh, uh, epigenetics. And this is why I spend a considerable amount of time chronicling the history of mental illness in psychiatry to locate the processes that are responsible for the ebb and flow of stigma. And I write that a couple of things seemed clear to me. One is that education and awareness, public service announcements and so on, have had a limited effect on the reduction of stigma. Stigma is not caused primarily by a lack of education or ignorance. Another is that medical and scientific advances are not necessarily the key to lessening the stigma of mental illness. Why? Because our judgments about mental illnesses have come from our definitions of what at different times and places people consider the ideal society and the ideal person. Stigma ebbs and flows as the result of things like ideologies of individualism and personal responsibility the complicated legacies of war, racism, and colonialism, all the things that shape the way in which we value or devalue individuals. Now, having said that, you know, we do not want to rule out the possibility that, you know, revolutionary treatments could decrease stigma. We've seen that with cancer. We've seen that with HIV AIDS. But given the complexity of the brain, psychiatry does not seem near that point. No truly novel psychiatric medications have been developed for decades. Improvements on existing medicines have been incremental. And we know that knowledge and successful treatments don't always eradicate stigma. Epilepsy, one of the most stigmatized conditions in the world, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia too. Despite both knowledge of the pathophysiology of seizure disorders and effective treatments. Consider electroconvulsive therapy. Um, it's, as you know, a very safe and effective strategy for treatment-resistant de depression. It saves lives. But for many reasons, it remains one of the most highly stigmatized and problematic treatments for mental illness, especially in California, to some extent, you know, as the result of the Church of Scientology, but for other reasons as well. While, you know, in contrast, the much larger amount of electricity directed toward the heart in ERs to revive somebody from a cardiac emergency is the hero. Now, I don't know if this is still true, but, um, you know, my most recent uh, search into this matter showed that California and Florida have the most strict laws regulating administration of ECT to adolescents and children. Um, and I don't think there are such stringent regulations for any other medically approved uh, procedure in California. So why is studying culture so important? Because it is culture that is the main factor in influencing how we treat, treat, consider mental illnesses. Consider neurodiversity. It grew not out of brand new knowledge, but out of changing economic and social conditions. Advocates for neurodiversity modeled the movement explicitly after the social model of disability. It's the idea that the environment in which you live, not the individual, is responsible for disability. In this view, for example, a person who is blind is only disabled when there are sidewalk obstacles or an absence of tact uh, tactile and auditory aids. Similarly, the disability of a person who's unable to speak or maybe is highly socially awkward is mitigated by digital communication like what we're doing right now or Zoom or uh, email or telecommuting. 
Economies now rely heavily on information services. There's been a move from manufacturing toward flexible production. And you know, this, the, the economic transformations have opened up a degree of uh, community integration that was formerly inaccessible for people with mental illnesses and disabilities in general. Um, just, a, I guess, a caveat or point of clarification before I forget, uh, the work that I'm writing about went in, into production just a couple of months uh, after the beginning of the pandemic. So I don't really um, cover uh, COVID, but obviously the, the remote capabilities that I've just referred to uh, have been amplified over the past two years. So why is it so important to look at social and cultural context? Because it can be more important than biology. And I wanna give you a sort of outside the box example, which is um, Martha's Vineyard, um, about 80 miles from Boston. Uh, uh, it's a, you know, today a rather elite uh, vacation spot, but it was a place for settlers in the 1700s, late 1600s and 1700s. And they didn't like to be on the mainland. They stayed on the island and they intermarried. And they intermarried so much that over several generations, the toll uh, began to, they, 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 it began to take a toll on them genetically. And they developed a certain degree of hereditary deafness on Martha's Vineyard. And uh, at some point in time in the, probably the late 1700s, early 1800s, up to a quarter to a third of people had some degree of deafness and they developed their own sign language. On the mainland, sign language was forbidden. It was thought to be a savage and primitive form of communication for the deaf, but they didn't know that on Martha's Vineyard. They developed their own sign language and everyone on the island spoke sign language, whether they were deaf or not. And sometimes people didn't know who was deaf or not deaf because of it. So why is this so interesting? Because culture created a biological condition, but then, Culture was powerful enough to conquer that, to adapt to it, so that to some extent we can say that no one was ever really truly deaf on the island of Martha's Vineyard. So this cultural perspective that I've been advocating is empowering because it means we do have the power to change things. Um, in the first part of the book, I do delve into a lot of historical information because I think it's important to understand that every society stigmatizes illnesses, but they all do it in their own way. The way that we stigmatize mental illnesses comes from our own particular historical processes. And the primary mover there is capitalism. In the the onset of capitalism and early capitalism, we see the development in Western Europe of an ideology of individualism, an ideology that, that, that celebrates autonomy and independence. The kind of thing that de Tocqueville wrote about in Democracy in America, in which he said, the American is ideally accountable to no one but himself, except perhaps God. And this may be why the most stigmatized illnesses are those that seem out of our control, like psychosis or substance abuse and addictions. Now in other societies, psychosis might be described as possession and it may not always be stigmatized. The person is not at fault, it's the spirit or some external factor that causes the spirit to act. The possessed may be less an object of disgust or fear and more of a victim. But what we see in our history is that capitalism, the decline of the joint family, urbanization created the conditions for mental illnesses to be described in a particular way as the antithesis of the ideal person. Capitalism created the conditions for the building of prisons and asylums, places in which large numbers of people were confined. And the mandate of the early asylums, consider you know, 1600s England, 1700s in France, for example, the mandate of asylums was not to house the insane or the disabled. It was to house the idle. It was people who did not work. And the people who were in these asylums came not from police who picked up you know, vagrants on the street, but rather families who brought their relatives to these asylums and said, 
this person is a drain on the household and they are not independent and autonomous. And increasingly, people were lumped together as prisoners, the insane, people with alcoholism, beggars, people who couldn't pay their debts, people with intellectual and physical disabilities. Now, before asylums, doctors had never before seen so many deviant individuals in a single space. But by the late 1700s, by some estimates, 1% of the population of Paris was confined. Within the asylums, they sought now to separate out this large group of people, this large assemblage into new categories. And that included new categories of mental illness. And to separate people with mental illnesses from people who had diseases of the body and to attempt to establish psychiatry as a new branch of medicine. Now, um, along with the growth of capitalism, we also see an effort among European scientists to try and understand what separated human beings from other animals. The asylum and its residents, who appeared to diverge again from the ideals of what a human should be, now provided the answer that humans have reason, animals don't. And in the records of early 18th century asylums in Europe, asylum workers described their residents as animal-like, as beasts capable of incredible strength or impervious to cold, heat, and pain. They were animals that needed to be tamed and controlled. And in this world into which mental illnesses would soon emerge as a distinct object of study, mostly well-meaning doctors, excuse me, believe that confinement and control of the body, including isolation and physical restraints and punishment, represented real progress. If you could control the body, you could control the mind. Even when Rene Descartes argues that the mind is distinct from the body, European scientists persist in linking control of the body to social ideas, to social ideals. Why is this? Because the separation of the body and mind could be used to actually reinforce pre-existing hierarchy and also reinforce the control of bodies. Scientists reason that if the mind and the body were separate, then perhaps elites were driven by their minds while the ill or the uneducated peasants laboring in the fields or in the factories were driven by instinct and appetite like animals. Hence, the authorities would have little compunction punishing the bodies of the poor when they committed even minor crimes like stealing a loaf of bread. For the poor, discipline for behavioral problems was administered against the body rather than the mind. And the countless people who were beheaded or hanged in England, uh, many of them for pickpocketing, were often referred to in England in the late 17th century and the early 18th century as dead commodities. Or in the words of um, the uh, British historian Peter Leinbach, the casualties of both capital punishment and the punishment of capital. Witch hunts directed at poor women were another form of bodily control crucial to the development of capitalist societies. Confident that population growth was the key to their personal um, uh, wealth and, and to grow national wealth, Men were afraid of anything that interfered with reproduction and their control over women's bodies. Just, I'm sorry, but saying that in this uh, particular historical context uh, kind, of, uh, kind of resonates. Men were afraid of anything that interfered with reproduction and their control over women's bodies. As I said that sentence, I, um, I thought about how shockingly relevant that sounded. Uh, but back to the present. Um, women were considered at best morally inferior to men and at worst, conspirators plotting to undermine economic progress. And it, of course, wouldn't be long before the process of harnessing women's bodies uh, in a capitalist logic would change the language of medicine. In the many editions of William's obstetrics and other texts, doctors would very soon call childbirth and delivery, uh, childbirth labor and delivery, uh, menstruation, failed production, and menopause a factory in decline. Um, sex for reasons other than reproduction, whether it was passion or masturbation, was quickly seen as the source of mental illness 
and is the source of the development of some foods we eat today, like graham crackers and granola, which were developed by Sylvester Graham and the Kellogg brothers, respectively, in order to decrease uh, sexual appetite, and which was the source of insanity. Um, so such separations between body and mind may also be at the heart of the ongoing stigma of mental illness, as I'll mention later, um, you know, in what I sort of see as a wrong-headed um, project in some circles to sort of um, overemphasize psychiatric disorders as brain disorders. Um, so asylums, I mean, I emphasize asylums because this is one reason why psychiatry itself uh, became stigmatized. It was a stigmatized profession. They weren't seen as real doctors. Uh, when my great grandfather was practicing in Chicago, I, um, he always called himself a neurologist because psychiatrists were just seen as asylum managers. Um, in Germany and Austria, uh, psychiatry was pretty much the domain of Jewish doctors because the non-Jewish doctors wouldn't allow them to do the higher status professions. Uh, the only um, profession that had lower status in late 19th century Austria was dermatology because it was mostly treating syphilitic sores and dermatology was known colloquially as Judenhaut, Jews skin. Uh, interesting how that's changed today, right? With the you know, dermatology is a very desirable residency uh, today. And um, it's funny, I even heard somebody recently say, because psychiatry is having so many more applicants to the residency programs that psychiatry is the new dermatology. At any rate, uh, during the 19th century, debates about confinement of the mentally ill also intersected with debates about another kind of bodily control and confinement, slavery. And many of you may know that a mental illness term developed in the um, early and to mid 19, 19th century called drapetomania. The criterion for this mental illness was the desire to no longer be a slave. I spent a lot of time in um, this work, Nobody's Normal, talking about wars. And the reason I do that is because wars were another context uh, in addition to capitalism and asylums that led to the development of psychiatry and psychology as bona fide disciplines. In fact, the history of the mental health professions should not be characterized by the slow incremental growth of knowledge, but by bursts of knowledge that are generated during wars. It's not to say wars are good. Wars are productive, productive in the sense that they draw on pre-existing conditions to, and, and sometimes, uh, create new situations, productive in that sense. Whereas asylums exacerbated the shame of psychological problems, wars reduced it in both military and civilian life. In wartime, psychiatric disturbances became uh, acceptable responses to stress. And because soldiers were in effect employed by the military, many of the people who might have been unemployed or stigmatized or, or even institutionalized were integrated into a, a new community, and many of their differences likely muted by conformity to military structure. In both the US and in the UK, record numbers of previously unemployed disabled people found their first paid jobs ever in positions that were vacated by those who joined the war effort as an additional uh, kind of uh, form of progress. But wars in their aftermath also show us that success in the battle against stigma can be quite precarious. Progress is often followed by regression back into the pre-war shame of mental illness. We see this World War I, World War II, the Korean War. The pattern of making progress and then sort of regressing is disrupted only when war activities are sustained for many years, as we saw with the long standing a military involvement of the US in Iraq and Afghanistan. As one result of those wars, the US military focused more intensively on the stigma of mental illness than at any other time in American history. To kind of sum this up, military psychiatry serves as a kind of microcosm 
through which we can see in sometimes exaggerated form, broad trends in the diagnosis, treatment, and moral judgments of mental illnesses. In World War II, for example, my grandfather ran psychiatric operations for a year in um, North Africa around the Tunisian campaign. Um, and he realized for the first time just how common mental illnesses were in American society. And he developed this perspective that people weren't abnormal, they were normal people in abnormal circumstances. He first realized there just how much stressors that originate outside one's body can cause or exacerbate emotional problems, and more important, just how many doctors needed to be trained. And probably, you know, the maybe the most important that mental illnesses were treatable outside of asylums and hospitals. It was uh, remarkable that during World War II, uh, one million of the 11 people, 11 million people who um, enlisted or were drafted um, were uh, discharged for neuropsychiatric reasons. And during the war, because of this high rate of mental illness, the army even wrote a manual called Medical 203. Medical 203, it was a manual for the diagnosis of mental disorders to ensure a degree of standardization among clinicians. And after the war, President Harry Truman says, wow, with all this mental illness in the war, we need to do something about it. So he founds NIMH directly as a result of the, uh, the, the, um, the prevalence of mental illnesses or neuropsychiatric disorders, as they were called, in the war. And then after he founds the NIH, NIMH, rather, he orders the military to adapt its manual for civilian use. And that manual, Medical 203, was adapted and that became the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders 1. We're now at five, but this was one. It was Medical 203, adapted in 1953. It was published as the DSM-1. Um, so boy, psychoanalysis and uh, uh, making its way uh, into the war had an incredibly positive impact on mental health care. It was psychoanalysis that really changed things because it brought, again, psychiatry out of the asylum into the general population. But I can go deeper than that for you, which is that it also changed the way people experienced distress. In World War I, people had symptoms of emotional distress that were highly physical. Um, awkward gait, mutism, temporary uh, loss of, of smell and taste, um, uh, vertigo, numbness, partial paralysis. And in World War II, with the emergence of psychoanalysis, soldiers now start to describe their symptoms more in terms of psychological rather than bodily stress. And those physical symptoms so common in World War I, like awkward gait and paralysis, nearly disappear. Um, it, it, it might, it, it actually seems rather magical, but as you all know, the story of any sickness is one that doctors and patients weave together, right? In which doctors and their patients find consensus about what constitutes culturally legitimate and sensible symptoms, sort of Freud called the sense of symptoms, at a particular moment in history. And the growth of psychoanalysis shows this well, as emotional distress was in effect normalized. By 1973, however, the civilian psychiatric establishment in concert with general opposition to the Vietnam War had developed resolutions to ban military psychiatrists from the APA, arguing that it was you know, irrelevant at best and at worst an immoral way to keep um, distressed soldiers back fighting. They had forgotten, or perhaps they never knew that their own ideas and practices had begun in the military. What are these things? the therapeutic community, group therapy, psychiatric screening as a preventive measure, psychological testing, the treatment of acute stress reactions, short-term psychotherapy, community psychiatry. These are all the things that actually began in the military, not to mention the DSM. Uh, it is interesting, by the way, uh, just how many political leaders have likened COVID to a war. Uh, and so we have to wonder uh, if, COVID, like a war, is also going to be a bit of an equalizer that uh, 
you know, when everyone is affected, emotional distress becomes not just reasonable or acceptable, but also expectable. You tell somebody today that you've been stressed out for the last two years, they're more likely to say, yeah, tell me about it, then you must be a fragile and weak person with poor moral character. In the um, third part of Nobody's Normal, I return to the earlier topic of the tensions between body and mind to argue that the distinction can reinforce the stigma of mental illness. So consider that in roughly one third of all patient visits to a neurologist today, this includes people with numbness, vision and speech impairments, seizures, paralysis, uh, there's no medical finding other than the symptoms themselves, no measurable or observable, or observable data, uh, no discernible cause for the symptoms. And doctors sometimes give some of these patients a diagnosis of functional neurological symptom disorder. Yet clinicians are reluctant to tell patients what functional neurologic symptom disorder means. I mean, it is, the, in a sense, the modern term for conversion disorder, physical symptoms that can't be explained medically which was once the modern term for psychosomatic disorders, which was once the modern term for hysteria. They know how people react as if they're being accused of fabricating their symptoms and as if their sickness isn't real. And this is why any mention of a psychiatric component to enigmatic chronic illnesses, including long COVID, produces such a strong reaction. A very recent editorial in the Annals of Internal Medicine claimed that mentioning psychiatric findings, whether as cause or consequence in relation to long COVID would increase the stigma of mental illness as if the researchers could hide the finding of a correlation between long COVID and a past or current history of, um, in this case, anxiety disorder. In fact, the opposite is true. Hiding the psychological aspects of illness is what exacerbates stigma and reinforces the false separation between body and mind. It is because of this stigma that clinicians have largely abandoned words like conversion, psychogenic, and psychosomatic. It's because of this stigma that the DSM introduced this awkward illness category, somatic symptom disorder, or why the American Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine decided to change its name to the Academy for Consultation Liaison Psychiatry. A lot of doctors don't even know what CL psychiatry is. So here's the problem that countless people who suffer terribly from a range of physical conditions could benefit from treatment within the psychological professions, but patients and doctors often collude to separate the body from the mind, to see diseases of the body as real and those of the mind as somehow fictive, even though that separation is the source of stigma and a barrier to mental health care. And one could argue that the medicalization of illness uh, actually encourages what doctors call somatization. You know, um, you comprehend physical complaints, even benign discomforts, as if they were physical diseases. Um, now, the reaction to many leaders of psychiatry to the ongoing stigma of mental illness is to argue that stigma and barriers to care will be reduced when we recognize that mental illnesses are also biological and or that they are illnesses like any other illness. When, when we can act directly on the brain through some means to treat mental illnesses. And the argument at first makes sense, right? Because somebody with a broken leg, you wouldn't hesitate to run, to, uh, not run, but go to the emergency room. Uh, but for people with schizophrenia, the average time from first psychosis to treatment is about 74 weeks. This is why Nancy Andreasen introduced the broken brain model. But we have to ask ourselves whether psychiatry may be emulating a false idol and falling into the trap of medicalizing mental illnesses. For one thing, as you all know much better than I do, much medicine is not very scientific or organ specific. Like people who go to a doctor because of headaches or fatigue. They're rarely treated with the assistance of brain imaging or lab tests and typically without a conclusion other than headache or fatigue. You all know better than I do that doctors mostly make educated guesses and estimates, like when cardiologists determine whether a blood pressure level is high, normal, or low. They don't do so because there exists in nature any absolute number 
for low, normal, or high blood pressure, but because a group in a medical professional organization have decided by consensus what should be low, normal, or high. So psychiatric conditions may appear to us to be less objective or fact-based because psychiatrists haven't yet developed such numbers themselves to fool us into thinking that psychiatry is objective and fact-based. Hope that makes sense. So remember the social model of disability. Well, just like medical disorders, mental illnesses are shaped by more factors than we can imagine. But in the broken brain model, it's the brain and not the person's social context that needs to be fixed. In the social model of the disability, uh, the emphasis is on the context, the person's environment that has to be fixed. And there are studies that suggest that describing someone with a mental illness as having a chemical imbalance or abnormal brain circuitry risks providing reasons to fear that person. What's more, major studies have shown that neurobiological conceptions of mental illness are not associated with significantly lower odds of stigma. I'm gonna wrap up because I know that I'm coming to the sort of 40 minute um, time or 35 minute time and, and simply wrap up by saying, I wanna go back to the very beginning and, 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 and talk about visibility and disclosure and, and say stigma is not eradicated when we isolate a disease to the brain. It's not eradicated when we teach people about it. It's not eradicated when someone hides their distinctive personality, skills, and challenges. Um, stigma can be eradicated if we change who and how, who we value, how we value them. Uh, if we accept, for example, that uh, dependence is not something to be ashamed of, that dependence is actually the human condition. If we create conditions in which um, our ideals are enacted in different ways if we can abandon some of the strong ideologies about autonomy and independence. For this reason, um, which the reason being hiding stigma creates, <laughs> hiding creates stigma and openness erases it. Um, I end the book uh, with a, something that's probably pretty odd for a book on mental illness, which is um, a discussion of the end of the book, The Scarlet Letter, the 1850, 354, something like that, um, Nathaniel Hawthorne book. Um, as you know, um, the book is about uh, a woman named Hester Prynne, Puritan, um, who is punished and shamed and uh, goes into exile. She has had to wear the scarlet letter A on her blouse, A for adultery. Uh, but there's this um, passage at the end that it often uh, just get, doesn't get talked about, where Hester returns to the village, and she's still wearing the A, and it's been like a decade. It's been many, many years, and everybody, even the harshest judges, say, it's over now. You can take your A off. You know, you've had your punishment. And she says no, and these are Hawthorne's words. It, she says that her letter A, quote, ceased to be a stigma, and she says that it became instead a symbol of her strength and endurance. And then as other people see this, especially women, they realize that Hester is more similar to them than different. In more modern language, I suppose, maybe they're on the same spectrum as Hester. And like Hester, we are now being more open, taking ownership, defining ourselves the way we want to be defined. I think the concept of the spectrum has really done a great service for us in that regard. There is certainly resistance to this. When an, a person who's neat and organized calls themselves a little OCD, when someone who says they're introverted like Jerry Seinfeld says he's a little bit on the spectrum, when a student tells me she has PTSD from an uh, econ final, they know that these conditions are very, very serious, that they can sometimes lead to horrible consequences. But they are also, by using such terms, by placing themselves on these broader spectrums, disarming the power of those words to hurt. They're using language and they're using culture to say, nobody's normal. And I am more like you than I am unlike you. It is impossible to end stigma completely. Every society will 
find something to demean and marginalize and do it in its own way. We did it through capitalism and individualism because that's the culture that we, we live in. But other societies will do it in their own way. But we can still resist, name, mute, shape it. Stigma is not a thing but a process. And that's empowering because we can change its course. And um, I'll just stop there and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about my book. Thanks a lot, uh, Richard, for that for the talk. And we do have a good 14 minutes for discussion. Um, I'd like to remind everyone in the audience to please enter your questions in uh, the Q&A. And we can see those questions and can address them. And so while everybody is thinking about their questions and writing them down, we can, I have a question for you, Richard. Um, so, um, Nobody's normal. So part of the argument is that we all have a little bit of mental illness, a little bit uh, of psychopathology within us. Um, there are some, right, that would turn that around and say, well, then actually nobody's pathological, um, right? Um, there, you know, the whole notion of normal is, is an illusion. Um, and so why didn't you title your book you know, nobody's pathological, or, or you know, why did you follow Thomas Saws, right? The, and the, the myth of mental illness, um, to be more provocative. But you know, I think um, neurodiversity, right? Part of the argument is um, we aren't damaged individuals. We have stuff that contribute. We have we have different perspectives, different experiences, and we, you know, we we want our voices heard. We want to be. Um, we don't want to be pathologized, labeled, and silenced. Um, and right, there's neurodiversity and also sort of mad pride. And, and one could argue, and I'm, I'm guessing you've heard this critique, that um, nobody's normal, you're, you're maybe extending the power and, and purview of psychiatry and of diagnosis, um, rather than you know, a, a depathologizing move, which, which may you know, give, you know, be more along the lines of neurodiversity. Well, uh, me, yeah, I, I thank you for the question. Um, it's a great question. Uh, the goal of the book is to increase care. In, I want more people to get mental health care. If I called the book Nobody's Pathological, that would be the opposite, the opposite goal. Um, people should, should be diagnosed and treated when they're suffering, right? So um, I mean, I serious, I have a, you know, serious disagreements with anybody who says, well, just, you know, psychosis is just another way of living. Well, you can't say that about the person who is hearing voices telling them that they're horrible and making them suffer. And you can't say that to the person who can no longer sleep or eat well or, or, how, or maintain their, their, their job or social interactions because, and, and say, oh, you're just, you know, <laughs> You're, that's not what I mean by nobody's normal. What I mean by nobody's normal is that we are all part of a spectrum of, of, of conditions. And the chances that any single individual is not going to have a, meet the criteria for mental illness in their lifetime is pretty low. The chances that their close relatives will not meet the criteria for mental illness is very, very low. So why do we need diagnosis and treatment? And why do we need labels? Labels or, Bennett or, or, or diagnoses are what we need to drive services. But, you know, it's only as good as the benefit or the service that it produces, right? And I think that there... Um, is you know an important thing uh, to learn here from uh, some of the treatments that people don't get, like electroconvulsive therapy. You know why should people have to suffer the way they do? Now, when somebody uh, says I'm you know neurodiverse and so on, they may mean I don't want my entire being to be constituted by the label of autism or something something else. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't need psychiatric care. If they're depressed, they have an anxiety use disorder, whatever it is, regardless of what kind of diversity you inhabit, you are not immune from mental illness. 
I don't know if that answers the yeah 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 exactly and and and, and um and um yeah I think that uh, thanks for the answer um and so we do have a a question here from from the audience um can you briefly explain how the period of enlightenment and the development of the scientific method in the West both benefited and harmed patients it seems to me that scientific investigations undermine classic belief systems that traditionally bind communities together for example, Christianity, it seems that mind-body dualism grows out of scientific investigations and frames psychiatric disorders as solvable problems, but also increases stigma. Yeah, so, you know, so the thing about the history of psychiatry is it's just, it's not linear, you know? There, it has its, its, its ups and its downs, and it's not a simple kind of um, trajectory. And, uh, what we, from our, you know, modern perspective, look at and say uh, might have been uh, damaging or horrible, uh, from the perspective of the people that were working at that time, it wasn't. Um, the doctors who, you know, blistered King George the Third's skin with acid in order and put him in chains in order order to try to help, you know, his what we now know, you know, is was a uh, was porphyria, but he, he they, you know, it was his quote unquote madness. Um, they really believed that they were helping him. Um, sometimes when we we look at um, history, we have to think of it as looking at another culture, in the sense that um, we have to try to figure out what their perspective was, even if we disagree with it. You know, when missionaries went to uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and sought to evangelize uh, during the colo colonial and, and pre-colonial era. They actually um, were somewhat progressive for their time. They actually saw the people they were working with as humans, as having souls that needed to be saved. Whereas other people were saying, "Well, how can you even say they have souls?" So we have to kind of put ourselves in the perspective of that society, not to cast judgment positively or negatively, but to understand what was their perspective? What were they, they doing that they thought was useful? And where did they get those ideas from? So if we take uh, the concept of uh, schizophrenia, for example, um, schizophrenia, uh, that emerges as a diagnosis uh, not just, you know, as split mind, not just because there were doctors who were looking at people who seemed to be developing normally and then started to slip away and have cognitive decline and, and hallucinations and delusions, but because there was in the beginning in the late 1700s and extending into the 19th century, a concern in arts and literature that the body and the mind were divided into good and evil, dark and light. Um, and that uh, within each person, there were two sides. And we get this, this, this notion of, of a splitting, which is, which is captured in that term, um, schizophrenia. Um, so, um, you know, the mind-body dualism thing is, I think, also, I'm glad that, that the question has been asked because, you know, we see it every day, uh, with, particularly with contested illnesses, right? With chronic Lyme, um, with um, uh, what is now called Havana syndrome, I guess, uh, the uh, people working in the embassy in Cuba, where any discussion of a psychiatric component becomes, you know, uh, seen as, as somehow an attack on the reality of their suffering. Yeah, and that's actually um, the, the um, sort of point about schizophrenia and where the name comes from is actually a nice segue to our next question. Um, what do you think about renaming psychiatric disorders to be less stigmatizing? I've heard an argument that um, any renaming would just switch stigmatization around from the former to the latter name and would not solve the issue. However, it does seem to me that psychiatric illnesses are named more negatively than other illnesses. For example, you have diabetes, not major diabetic disorder. And of course, there are um, movements to rename um, schizophrenia, for example, right? So this, I think this is a, a great question. Yeah, it's a hard one to answer succinctly. Um, 
But I do argue in the book, I don't like to use the word disorder uh, because we don't know what order is. And I think the notion of disorder comes from this long you know, history, including the German romanticism and British you know, literature that I was talking about, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, Faust, Doppelganger, uh, uh, Frankenstein, the, the, you know, the, 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 that kind of splitting. Um, uh, that um, it, in anthropology, as you know, we use disorder and disease as the technician's lens, but we use illness to describe the person's full experience of life. So you can, you know, you can look at a tumor and say, oh, this is a group of abnormally growing cells, but that doesn't tell you, and you know, and call it a certain kind of cancer, but that doesn't tell you how the person's life is turned upside down and how their social relationships and their ideas and how they pursue care or don't pursue care is, none of that stuff is, is visible under a microscope, right? Um, so I have no problem with labels as long as they don't produce something negative. Now in Japan, up until the turn of the century, um, in, you know, after sometime after 2000, the word for schizophrenia was changed. And there's pretty good evidence that it had a dramatic effect for the good. Um, prior to changing the name for schizophrenia, the word for schizophrenia in Japanese really meant a mind torn asunder. I mean, it was a horrible term. So if somebody got diagnosed with schizophrenia, they wouldn't actually be even told the word. They might not even tell the family of the person. But when the Japanese uh, equivalent to the American Psychiatric Association changed it to a very bland term, which is something like integration condition, or would translate something very, very vague, uh, the rates of diagnosis and rates of treatment went way up. So, yeah, I mean, there are also labels that we that we we have had that we don't need. We don't need Aspergers anymore, right? Aspergers was needed at a particular point in time when we needed a less stigmatizing word, and introducing that word was great because it helped to expand the spectrum and destigmatize autism. Now that the spectrum is so big, and now that neuropsychiatrists will, by their own admission, say, "Yeah, we could never reliably distinguish between subtypes of autism anyway," and Asperger's is just autism without the language delay, we don't need it anymore. So now we can get rid of that term. So, so language is about what is useful and meaningful at a particular point in time, and also language is about using it creatively. Judy Rappaport, who ran child psychiatry for decades at the NIMH, was a very, very rigorous scientist who always followed protocols, you know, to make sure that her research subjects were comparable to other research subjects. But she told me in an interview that I, I cite in the book, I'll call a kid in my clinical work, she said, I'll call a kid a zebra if it gets that kid into the best classroom for that kid. Great. Um, well, we have reached the end of our time and uh, the end of our questions. So like, just to really thank you so much for this uh, presentation and, and for sharing the last hour with us. And I'd like to um, welcome everyone back to our Grand Rounds next week. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be with all of you.